gas prices are the highest they've been since 2014. President Biden has personally stepped in to bring them down. Not everyone is happy with how he's doing it. But how much power does he really have over gas prices? Welcome to America Uncovered, I'm Chris Chappell. This episode is sponsored by Blinkist. Do you want to read books that make you more confident and more educated, but you don't have enough time? Well, Blinkist gives you access to thousands of amazing titles in audiobook form. It's an easy way to get more knowledgeable every day. I'll tell you more at the end. So let's talk about gas prices, the kind that give you sticker shock. Gas prices are going up, especially in California where it's over four and a half bucks a gallon, which on the bright side is at least still cheaper than a gallon of pumpkin spice latte, which the average California runs on every day. But prices are up all over the US. Everyone's talking about it, from NBC to CNBC to CNN to CBS to Fox. For those of you at home playing the mainstream media bingo game, hey look, you just won. Although if you're actually watching that much mainstream media, then you lose. Gas prices have hit their highest since 2014. According to the AAA gas price tracker, as of October 20th, the average gas price in the United States as a whole is $3.35 per gallon. Prices have been steadily rising since November 2020. And that has some people feeling uneasy, especially people in Florida who use gasoline to coat the floor of their boat. Now, if you're the president, rising gas prices and a seven-year high are no joke. And neither was that thing I said about Florida. Florida man strikes again. In response to rising gas prices, President Biden has tried a few different things. No, President Bush, we are not going to do that again. Back in August, Biden asked OPEC and its allies, collectively called OPEC Plus, to increase production. But that didn't work out so well. So in September, he tried again. This time, OPEC hasn't outright refused, but they appear to just be ignoring Biden, kind of the same way Biden treats the media. Thank you very much. For someone so old, Biden is leaving them on red like a millennial. But when it comes to gas prices, Biden wasn't about to give up. A few days ago, he turned to the American oil industry for help. We'll see how that goes, but Big Oil argued back in August that Biden should have come to them first. They seem to feel a bit snubbed, so I don't know how likely they are to help. It's like turning down someone for prom and then asking them to help you move. And Big Oil aren't the only ones unhappy with Biden's decision to request increased production from OPEC+. On October 14th, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy and a number of other representatives sent a letter to President Biden arguing that instead of continuing to call for increased prosperity for OPEC plus affiliated nations that seek to harm the United States, we should meet American needs with American produced energy. Of course, this is the 21st century, so by sent a letter to Biden, what I mean is they posted the letter on Twitter. And since it is the 21st century, Biden probably took one look at this novella and said, TLDR. McCarthy asked Biden to embrace an American solution by rescinding executive orders and other policies designed by your administration to reduce access to our country's oil and natural gas resources. Specifically, they're unhappy with Biden for canceling the Keystone XL pipeline, proposing to ban domestic fracking declaring a moratorium on oil and natural gas leases on federal lands and waters, and changing tax law to harm domestic production. I guess they didn't get the memo that Biden has actually backed some of Trump's drilling projects. They'd know that if they'd subscribe to America Uncovered. But the letter from Kevin McCarthy and others argues that looking to domestic sources for oil will not only increase American economic and job growth, enhance national and energy security, and lower energy prices for American families, but it will also result in reduced global emissions, 
as the United States produces energy with an environmental responsibility that exceeds those of other nations upon which you wish for America to rely. There's a lot of oil here in America. We could harvest tons just from Kim Kardashian's hairbrush. The letter came down hard on the Biden administration's energy policies, and all of that went back to, ultimately, rising gasoline prices for Americans. But is the president really to blame for rising gas prices? More on that after the break. Welcome back. Can any president, including Biden, really be blamed for rising gas prices? Well, Americans have a long history of blaming the president for high gas prices, including President Nixon in 1973, President Carter in 1979, President George W. Bush in 2006, President Obama in 2012, and President Trump in 2018. President Trump, of course, was more than happy to take personal credit for gas prices, just as long as they were low. Then when they were high, he was happy to blame Obama. Thanks, Obama. So while gas prices do go up and down, at least the idea of blaming the president is consistent. And why should Biden be any different? Some mainstream media op-eds are even comparing Joe Biden to Jimmy Carter. And not just because they both look like they'd wear dress socks with a bathing suit. But how much power does the President of the United States really have over gas prices? Clearly, there's some disagreement over that, with some presenting opinions in favor of Biden and others presenting opinions not in favor of Biden. Meanwhile, back in September, Biden presented his own hypothesis on who's to blame for the high gas prices. We're also going after the bad actors and pandemic profiteers in our economy. There's lots of evidence our gas prices should be going down, but they haven't. We're taking a close look at that. Bad actors? So Mark Wahlberg is behind high gas prices. I should have known. Biden's hypothesis spurred its own flurry of reactions from the media, both left-leaning and right-leaning. So who is to blame for high gas prices? Pandemic profiteers? The president? Marky Mark? Well. If presidents had a magic wand that could make gas prices go down, they probably would use it, which would mean that gas prices would only ever go down, in the same way that stonks only ever go up. Since that's not the case, maybe NBC's experts are right. Maybe it's just not that simple. We'll take a look after the break. Welcome back. People often blame the president for high gas prices, but is that reasonable? It's kind of like criticizing Chris Christie for his weight, when you should only criticize him for things he can actually control, like his policies, his temperament, and his weight. Well, it turns out that, like most things having to do with economics, gas prices just aren't that simple. I mean, it is simple, really. It's all about supply and demand. But when it comes down to the details, supply and demand become surprisingly complicated. Let's start with demand. That feeling you get when you see a go-kart with a cup holder for your beer. I demand one for myself. And according to Phil Flynn, an energy analyst at the Price Futures Group, post-COVID gas demand came back stronger than people anticipated. After all, when COVID fear and lockdowns hit in 2020, people stopped driving. And the price of gasoline fell to a four-year low of $1.94 in April 2020. Now the economy is reopening. People are getting back out there. They're driving to work. They're eating at restaurants. They're crossing state lines for abortions. America is back. In fact, people are driving more now than they were before the pandemic began, according to this chart from CBS News. According to Axios, high demand for natural gas in Europe and China has led to natural gas shortages and high prices. And that has led some power companies to use oil instead of gas which has pushed up the price of oil, which has pushed up the price of gasoline. After all, in a globalized world, what happens in Europe and China doesn't stay in Europe and China. Well, except the Uyghurs in China. They stay there because they're not allowed to leave. Finally, we just ended the summer driving season, when demand for fuel is always up, especially this year, thanks to a summer of post-lockdown revenge travel. In fact, demand for fuel is so much higher during the summer that there is a federal environmental regulation requiring refineries to produce a greener blend of gasoline in the summer. It has less emissions, 
but is more expensive to produce because it yields less gasoline per barrel of oil. It can cost up to 15 cents more per gallon just to make. But at least it's better for the environment when it's sprayed across Florida man's boat deck. Now let's talk about supply. That thing you have too much of if you've got a squirt vending machine. No one wanted a grapefruit flavored soda when it was fresh, and those cans have obviously been sitting in there for 30 years. There have been all sorts of problems with supply. First of all, COVID was not kind to oil production. According to the Energy Information Administration, crude oil production in the U.S. fell 8% in 2020 compared to 2019. This was the largest annual decline in the U.S. Energy Information Administration's records. This is at least partially due to lingering effects of COVID. And because they still refuse to see Kim Kardashian as a natural resource. Meanwhile, recently some U.S. oil companies have gone bankrupt, which has investors demanding more focus on returns from the ones that didn't go bankrupt. That's making them cautious about investing in expanding oil production. Basically, investors are scared and it's affecting the market. What else is new? The super freeze in Texas earlier this year also reduced the capacity of oil refineries. Hurricane Ida didn't help either, and neither did Ted Cruz. He didn't hurt, but he certainly didn't help. And that's just domestic oil production. We already talked about how OPEC Plus has responded to requests for it to increase production. Basically, now nah, we're going to do what we're going to do anyway raise production super slowly from seriously reduced COVID levels to keep prices high so we can make more money. No, President Bush, we aren't going to do that either. Though it is tempting. The problem is OPEC is the only organization with the ability to ramp up production quickly enough to make a global difference, which might explain why Biden keeps going back to them. And of course, as the world's largest economies keep transitioning to renewable energy, that affects production of gasoline as well. But production is only the first step of supply. Ugh. After that, you have distribution, getting gasoline to the pumps. You've probably heard that the United States has been having some supply chain issues lately. The U.S. has also been having problems with worker shortages, including a shortage of tanker drivers. Then there was the hack of the Colonial Pipeline back in May. Basically, the quickest way to give Americans gas these days is with Panera Bread. So gas prices have a lot of different factors involved, but what about Biden's energy policies? After all, he did revoke the permit for the Keystone XL pipeline. Won't that have an effect on distribution? Well, the Keystone XL pipeline was still under construction when Biden revoked the permit. So while it would have increased distribution in the future, it doesn't really have an impact on current distribution. The pipeline was officially canceled by the energy company this summer. Biden also put a moratorium on oil and gas leases on federal lands, which accounts for about 22% of U.S. oil production. Won't that have an effect on supply? Well, the thing is, it would appear the oil and gas companies were ready for that. According to the Department of the Interior, the oil and gas industry has stockpiled millions of acres of leases and is sitting on approximately 7,700 unused approved permits to drill. Oh, so when oil and gas companies hoard land, they're shrewd businessmen. But when I hoard newspapers, I have a problem. Get away from my news fortress! So that also might have a long-term effect, but probably isn't affecting gas prices right now. What it seems to come down to is this. The only way Biden could directly be responsible for rising gas prices would be if his administration implemented a federal gas tax or changed the laws related to gas. And the only way Biden could directly lower gas prices would be to open up the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, like he did after Hurricane Ida. But that's supposed to only be for extreme emergencies. So maybe it's true. Maybe the president simply doesn't have a magic button to control gas prices. That's probably for the best, since it's already scary enough what presidents do have buttons for. And this episode is sponsored by Blinkist. If you're the kind of person who wants to learn and improve yourself, you're going to love Blinkist. It's got thousands of books in all these categories. Politics, history, money and investment, and dozens more. 
I love Blinkist because it helps me find titles I'm interested in. Like this one I recommended, The Psychology of Money, which helped me understand how to think about long-term investing. Blinkist condenses thousands of titles into 15-minute audiobooks. I can read them or listen to them podcast style. It's great for my commute or just while I'm doing stuff around the house. I can also access them offline. Blinkist also gives me full-length audiobooks. Blinkist already has 14 million active users, and they're offering a special deal for America Uncovered fans. The first 100 people to go to Blinkist.com slash America Uncovered are going to get unlimited access for one week to try it out. You'll also get 25% off if you want the full membership. So check out Blinkist. Link is below. Your seven-day trial is completely free, and you can cancel at any time during this period. So why not try it out? And you'll see just how much you can learn. I'm Chris Chappell. Thanks for watching America Uncovered.